So good evening, everybody. I'm Ingrid Woolard. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences here at Stellenbosch University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you, both in person and those of you online, to this young alumni event. So we're very privileged as the EMS faculty to be doing this in collaboration with the Development and Alumni Relations Office. This is part of a whole week of events around the theme of the world of work. Given that it's Women's Month, we're particularly excited about the fact that our entire panel this evening is made up of women. Um, we're looking forward to, to hearing about uh, our guest speakers' journeys through their own careers and, and listening to their tips for how we can all uh, progress and, and have winning strategies at work. So I'm very excited to hear some of their, some of their, some of their tips for us. It's my role not to introduce the guest speakers, but just to introduce you to our facilitator for this evening, um, Karabo Magoshwe. Karabo is a fifth year BAC LLB student, um, so a, a student both in the Faculty of Law and in the EMS faculty. She's also the chairperson of our student society, the EBSK, and it's been my great privilege to work alongside Karabo for the last year. She describes herself as a puzzle solver by trade and as intellectually curious by nature, which I think is just a delightful and very accurate way for her to describe herself. She strives to be a passionate leader who is inspirational, intentional, and interesting. As an Alan Gray Orbis candidate fellow, she believes in entrepreneurship and having a positive impact on her community. She'll be doing that um, herself as she steps out into the world of work next year as a candidate attorney. So thank you so much, Karabo, for facilitating for us this evening. Um, I'm going to hand over to you to introduce our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Prof Willard. And thank you to the faculty of EMS for the opportunity and to the alumni office. And we're very wishing you a very warm welcome to everybody at home. And I hope you have a very lovely evening listening to what the speakers have to say. So it is my great pleasure to introduce the two speakers tonight. And on my left, it is Prof. Rachel Jafta, who is the Professor of Economics um, in the Department of Economics in the School of Economic and Management Sciences, as well as the Chair of the Board of um, Media24, which is very exciting. And further on my left, we have Ms. Terry Falkvane, who is the former CEO of Prime Media in South Africa, and it's it's I'm very excited to hear what they have to say and some of the tips that these very established women have for people entering the world of work or trying to navigate the space, um, especially when they're young and vibrant and um, wanting to pave a great career path. So thank you very much. Um, if Prof Jafta, you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, so I'll give a little context. I come from a very small town in the Karoo. You probably know it because of the Southern African Large Telescope. Today, my professional life consists of three parts that all put me in contact with the world of work. So all three parts of my professional life puts me in contact with the world of work. So here at the University of Stellenbosch, we um have the task and i fulfill that with pleasure to try and um, build the graduate attributes that prepare our students for the world of work then in the business world um at media 24 and process and naspers i serve on the nominations committee so this is the committee that looks for talent um across diversity and across geographies for people to serve on the board. So in that sense, we have to be aware of what is going on, for example, in the talent pipeline and so forth. And at Media24, I am um, part of the HR committee. And this is a very interesting learning school for me because things change so quickly. And because technologies are changing so fast, we also have to prepare the people who work for us and the pipeline where we might source people to work for us to adapt to a world where the technologies are changing so fast. So I'm going to stop with that context and I hope the questions will draw out of me how it came about that I am wearing these three hats. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Prof. Rachel, for that lovely introduction. I think there's going to be a lot of questions in the chat, which we are monitoring, and a lot of questions that I have personally as someone going into the world of work. Um, Terry, I have a question for you about your introduction, and let's see if we can find any synergies that we can have a lovely discussion about, if you'd like to introduce yourself. But so I'm Terry Falkvane. I'm currently retired, actually, so I'm out of the crazy world of business, but I too was born in a small town called Valk in the Free State. Um, I think when we come from small towns, we head for the big cities, but um, I landed up in a media career. Um, I didn't have an academic background. I landed up in a company, fell passionately in love with radio. So I was always working in that division and my background was in sales. So I started my career out in sales where I learned probably everything I applied when I made my way up to management. So a, a lot of what you learn in sales or a sales type background gives you a great insight into people. And um, if you know my background, you'll see there's a lot of work I do with people, believe in my staff. So I drive, I drove my success in my career by working with and through the people, the staff. Um, I landed up going into management. I was the sales manager. We did very well there. I then was made um, head of one of the radio stations, a new acquisition we took out of the SABC. And we had to transform that station into from a public broadcaster basically to a commercial one. So that was a very interesting exercise. Um, we did very well there. Um, and the group subsequently grew to five businesses. So there were four radio stations, two in Cape Town, two in Joburg. And we also started an independent news organization when I was made CEO of the broadcasting group. So not then just the radio division. And I was CEO for 17 years, which was quite a long time for that tenure. And I retired six years ago. I'm currently now in my own consultancy with a partner and we spend our time going into businesses to help with leadership, leadership training, um, also to look at companies' processes and how things are working and what, what they're doing in there. So we basically like to call ourselves flippers. So we, we go in and we try and flip a business quite radically in a short period of time by really coming in with fresh eyes and just doing what we feel is right. So that's my background. <laughs> It's a very interesting background and I think one which perhaps your CV or when you're looking for information for somebody, it doesn't really tell as good a story as you can hear once someone is really explaining their own story. So it's very lovely to hear that perspective. Um, Terry, I actually have a question. As you say, you're flippers. So um, when you're looking into the cultures of some of these companies, I'm sure that there are a lot of things that remain which are wonderful that they have and a lot of things that you identify which need to change. What role does talent and the people and the talent that they already have and what do you look for when looking at rising talent within these companies that you flip? What are sort of some things that really shine for you as really good things to have in talent in an employee pool? So, you know, I'm fortunate and also if you speak to my mentors, because um, before I came here, I was actually reading something that somebody wrote about me and they called me a rebel <laughs> as somebody who doesn't sit down quietly, etc. But the main thrust of a lot of the things they mention is my ability with talent. And I think this is the key thing and it comes back to the people thing. So when we go into businesses, we do look for the talent. Um, when you work with talent for a long time, you can, you can pick it immediately. They're normally the troublemakers <laughs> who are my grade two. They sit in a different sort of role and they see things differently, but they're key to an organization. So we always look for the talented people. A caveat, a concern with them is they often don't play nicely or work within the team and no company can be successful without teamwork. But you can get them there if you know how to press their buttons and how to surround them with the people that they need because talented people are basically insecure. So they simply need a network around them to feel safe, to perform. And in radio, you know, the talent on air is what makes the whole business at the end of the day. Because if the product's not great, you've got nothing. So, yeah, we look for the key talent and we try and hold on to them. And that's the challenge. The work is around the key talent. 
That's very interesting that it it's such a there's two types of that that these very talented people who you really want to shine can also be quite difficult people to work with sometimes or difficult to really let that talent shine. And I'm sure, Prof Rachel, that you have some experience with this of some people who have some troublemakers in the classroom as well as in the corporate space. So just how do you how, how do you think, or what opportunities do you think that they are for you to identify these people at an education level when they're still in university? And what do you do, if anything, to raise them up to what they could be if you can see that in them? I heard um, the comment about rebels. I immediately thought about. Just put the mic closer. Thank you. Um, I immediately thought about my experience in my community engagement role, because when we started the Cape Town Carnival, remember I am trained as an economist, so it's not, a carnival is not something you would normally <laughs> associate with um, an economist. Um, so I had to learn to work with very talented, creative people, and creative people I found are brilliant, but also if they are happy, they're exuberantly happy, and if they're unhappy, they're down in the dumps, and it, it's a challenge to bring them back up. Um, so in that regard, I had um, I'd learned a similar lesson to Terry, and that is that you have to surround them with the right people that would understand them, understand their brilliance, but also understand their needs to function well. So looking back now to 12 years of doing that, um, I can actually take some of those lessons that I've learned there into the business world and also into my classrooms. So we have very large groups undergraduate. I teach at the moment second years and they must be almost 500 divided into two groups. And um, it is often um, the students who, who can't sit still um, that are the ones that are very talented. So I've learned early on that you have to engage them. Um, probably they've already read everything there is to read in preparation for the class and you have to give them an extra challenge. The most um, talented student in economics I think I've ever had had gone on to do a PhD in economics and statistics at the University of Stanford. But he um, would be so well prepared and so well read that it was a challenge to me <laughs> to make sure that I have enough challenges for him in my back pocket to keep him busy so that he doesn't get bored in class because all educators know if some, someone is bored in your class, they're going to be distracted and pretty soon the people around them will be distracted. Um, so to sum up at that point is to, to try and get to understand where people's strengths and challenges lie and see if you can uh, call on other people in a team to help address that. Thank you. There are so many really important points that you're making about um, highlighting individual people's strengths and really looking for that and knowing what to look for is something that I'm sure the both of you have honed, a skill that you've honed over the past very many successful years of your career. So I really do commend you for that. And if there's any questions from the team's chat, if there's anybody, feel free to type up your questions and we will raise them to the speakers. But I have another question actually of, um, as you're saying, some of these really talented people have also been, when they've been gotten to the stage of being in a room with the both of you, it's also a, a, a chance of they were the right people with the right amount of talent and getting into the room. Are there any moments in your individual careers where do you, you'd say that it's sort of fate that you've ended up in the correct rooms with people who've really been able to leverage you and support you in your career development? And are you playing that role for any other people? I don't think it was fate um, in my case because I was with the same business for so long. But within the company, there were two or three key individuals that noticed my talent. But 
my reward came from performance. So because it was on the sales side, the performance was there. So I, I mean, for any business, it's always about the money. So the person sitting with the money, which was sales, everybody listened to what sales were doing, right? So you had the ear. I think the difference in what turned my career from sales into management was having the confidence to speak up when you are in management on other areas of the business. And I think another point I wanted to say is when you start in a company, no matter what your position is and what your role is, try and do everything. So you learn the business, especially if you're passionate about the business and it's something that you really want to get involved with because that those nuggets of learning, you've been in the trenches, you learn how everything works. When you do get to management, if that's your aspiration, nobody can fool you about what's going on. But you've got to make yourself be seen. And if you're in a role where you are being seen, I think you need to contribute to the business outside of your areas of expertise. And in my case, clearly some of the things were landing well. So the, the, the interest grew. And yes, once it was there, the support was there and I was pushed by one or two individuals. And the other thing I want to say is in business, it's always very important to have a business mentor, which I did have. So I found a trainer that I enjoyed working with, with the staff who also mentored me. And he was with me for 15 of my 17 years. So that's all I have to say at this point. <laughs> I absolutely agree on the last point of having either a coach or a mentor is um, incredibly important, especially if it's someone that's not in your direct work environment because they could then be an independent sounding board for you. Um, my, the instances where I was noticed, I didn't know that I was noticed. Somebody was asked about me um, in another interview said it beautifully he said it seemed as if i was enjoying what i was doing so much <laughs> and that caught their interest and it also meant that every time a new door opened it was a new environment for me and i had to learn a whole lot of new things for example in preparation um, to become the chair of the media 24 board I went on an ex executive education program at Harvard Business School um, to learn more about what that role would mean, what it would require of me, and especially how one would um, manage a very diverse board. And in the first place, make sure that it becomes a very diverse board. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, so I think probably one of the most important insights for me would be that one has to be ready when the opportunity arises. There, it's not as if one can say, "Wait, wait, wait! Give me eighteen months, I'll get ready." Um, that and that one, although you might feel very scared on the inside if you get a new opportunity, if it feels right, the jitters that you have. Um, will probably be like a push to help you to perform better if it doesn't feel right. If you have a very uncomfortable doubt about it, then probably your personal company, compass is telling you that this is not right for you. And that is important to listen to as well. Wow, some really, really great insights. I'm very happy to be learning about this as somebody who's going into the world of work next year. And it's, it's quite daunting and it can be, as we've heard from some of our peers, from those of us who are going to be young alumni or are young alumni, this, the learning curve can be really quite steep. And a lot of people really struggle with making themselves or um, they have the competence and the ability to shine, but sort of feeling that confidence, which you are both saying is key in a successful career. So I then have the question of um, what, especially considering that both of you came from small towns, um, how does somebody from a small town who may feel like a very small fish in a very big pond, especially in the corporate environment, really get into that confidence and be able to lean into that? If you have any tips that have helped you in moments of, of uncertainty of what can get you through when you're feeling that 
nervousness and that uncertainty of whether this is the right fit for you? I think um, one of the things that you need to do is just small wins. So when you do get in, it's like putting little notches in your belt, you know, and small wins can can do that for you when you get in there. I also want to say it's such a good point, particularly for women and for female, and I'm not saying that men don't have the ability, but a woman's intuition and gut feel on an environment or a business, if the fit doesn't feel right, so you get into the place and it's not your type of environment, so the culture of the company is not for you, you're never going to be happy. And if you're not happy, you're not going to perform. So that's another thing is, a, is you will feel the fit. And if you do feel the fit and you do believe in what the company stands for, and I think that that's also very important when you go into a business, is to look at beyond just the business. So business has changed from just making money, although that still is in a commercial world the key thing. But you can couple that with good CSR work. You can couple it with very good training mechanisms, development of people in your business. And you can balance the two. And if you get that right, your business is actually more successful. So, yeah. I absolutely agree with that point. We find very often now when we interview, um, when we recruit, that candidates ask about our values and whether we live that value, those values, and whether we care about the communities in which we operate and whether we can demonstrate as an evidence based that we care about the communities where we operate. So um, candidates are more assertive and rightly so. Um, uh, in response to your question, in economics, we often talk about social capital. So it's the kind of connections you make, the knowledge you gain from very often informal interactions. And over the last two years, I really worried about our students not being able to do that. Um, when we're here on campus, we have an open door and they can come in or they could ask anything between lectures and we're just here yeah, we're available and there's a lot of value we can add but because students were not here on campus they didn't get that and the same in the corporate world when we're in our offices for example when um, someone is preparing something to go into a digital edition um, they could easily just walk across and ask someone for advice and now they can't do it. Now they have to set a Zoom meeting to be able to do it or a phone call. So that social capital that you build with people that you connect with, um, I think that is incredibly valuable um, for your career. And it also because you absorb a lot of knowledge and tips and so it also helps you to help other people which again expands your social capital and this is something that it's almost a bit like the lubricant of the system if I can call it that. Mm, very very interesting points and I'm probably going to be saying that a lot um, throughout this conversation because I'm just really in awe of the amount of experience that I have and the depth of really wonderful careers which as um, Prof. Willard said, in the Women's Month, it's so lovely to have women speakers speaking about their very successful careers. So once again, thank you for coming and sharing your experiences. Um, so then I do have a question from the chat from somebody. Um, there is a question specifically for both of you because you are both the media industry. Um, somebody has asked, it seems that many platforms today are looking to hire um, people who bring an audience with them. So you have two successful can talented candidates and one is already an influencer or has that social capital which you were speaking about um, that will count heavily in their favor as opposed to the other person who is equally talented but doesn't have those networks per se. Um, so the question is then, is it essential to already be an influencer to be hired in broadcast today? There's a perception that we all need to be building our own followings, but this is difficult if you're trying to transition from a different career or from a completely different department. So I think a lot of people, what may be the concern here or what I'm reading as the concern is just how much do you need to have in your pocket already 
especially because a lot of people don't have a lot of those networks already, especially after the two year, these past two years of missing that face-to-face -face interaction. So how much does it count in your favor if you have those networks and people who don't have a, an established alumni network or family who can get their foot in the door, how can they help themselves shine and how much does it count? Maybe you can start, Prof Rachel? Thank you. It's probably less so for us because we're not in broadcasting and we we actually have quite a, um, a system of preparing people for the workplace for, for media specifically um, with university interactions and um, engagements in schools and then a bursary program and a journalism program. And when we recruit engineers it's normally we don't expect them to have followers <laughs> although some of them are rock stars um but we can't get enough of them so it really we we have to pull out all the stops um to get enough talent in that regard um it does help though um if you have a more how can I say, like a, a more well-rounded CV. So instead of having just a career, uh, sorry, just um, a degree and uh, very narrowly focused on your subject fields, um, one of the most important things is to be able to distinguish yourself or di differentiate yourself from a whole lot of other people with the same degree. And here is, um, comes in doing different things. For example, being involved in student organizations if you're still here, but if you're in the workplace, um, for example, social impact initiatives or social entrepreneurship. In Media24, we have a system where we encourage a thousand days of social impact by allowing people to take time off specifically to do that and it is um, documented and rewarded and it gives them also a sense of the communities that they write for um i will stop there so that's that's quite the so in response to the question then i suppose one can say that it's not necessarily about who you know or how many people you know but how you use those relationships and how well-rounded of a person they make you that's appealing to some of these companies from the HR perspective. Is that correct? Correct. Um, let me give you one example that's just um, come up. Um, we were recruiting for, um, for a community project people that were interested in coding. And some of the people with potential who were not yet programmers, but understood music um, they were doing so well because there's much of a similarity between music and coding um, so that they had that experience it was completely unexpected but that helped them in their coding career interesting <laughs> insights uh, do you have anything to add to that terry i do actually so my background is in radio and it's a very interesting question that because I've been in, I was in radio for a very long time, still am. But in the early days, nobody had, there was no social media, which was actually a blessing because <laughs> you created the product on air and, and that was it. Then social media started, which gave broadcasting another business. So you now have had the online version of what you were doing on air. So it was a great add-on, but it cost a lot of money to put that in because that wasn't our knitting. But you had to be in the game to survive. So this is where a lot of radio stations went wrong. They put a lot of money into the digital, Facebook, creating the websites, etc., and spent so much money there that doesn't deliver because we just don't have the numbers in South Africa for these platforms. And, and Google just kills you everywhere. So you've got to learn to work it. And personalities who did have followings were interesting to us. And from my experience, I'm going to say this, it's actually problematic because many of the big stars today who get onto radio are not radio stars. They're from television. 
They have a massive following because they're in a soap opera, which is fine. That's a career. But that doesn't translate well to good radio. Um, and then they're so busy taking care of their followers instead of the radio listener that the two start to split apart. And many a fight you've seen in the media or people who've been shifted off air, and I'm sure in my day as well, if you Google it, where you clashing big time in the labor courts with these talented people because they take your business off track. Um, and they also start to do stuff. And here comes corruption, doing the right thing. It leads them into a different space where they're engaging with clients and doing more on their social media feed for that product than what the client is paying to be on what your business is about. It's now become very problematic for radio stations and one of the key things we have to deal with because they have to be committed to the business that you're in. So you don't just take a radio gig because it's nice to do the traffic on breakfast with a nail air so I can get a couple of grand here, but I'm actually interested in my TV show and I'm interested in my three million followers. And it detracts. It detracts from the role that they play. So things are going terribly wrong there, and I don't think it's right. Just because you have a big media following doesn't make you good at or proficient at the role the business might need you in. And these wills are starting to clash, and privacy is becoming a big thing. There's a drawback. And even for the public who follow these personalities, you soon see or pick up in their feed what's real, what's not, and it becomes annoying. So I think it's it's nice to have both and to build it together and to build that platform, but to have the two platforms separately. Also in law, you can't separate them. So if they are on their private platform, are calling somebody an idiot, right? When they get on air, people reading their profile, the first call through on the line is, you know, you call so-and-so an idiot and all of a sudden you're now in the public domain with public defamation suites and, the, and things going on. So... I don't think it's totally necessary, but it is difficult to get into the creative world anywhere, anywhere in the world. It's limited spaces. And what we did, we, we had training slots. So we used to put people, mainly from university radio stations. So that's where the love of radio would start. They would phone you. We would bring them in. We would let them, you know, do a show for us, see if they had A, the voice, which is the most important thing on radio. And then just be interesting and from there we would train them on that terrible graveyard shift so um but many a talent came from there i mean anela is one of them anela was found out of a, a competition we ran um and she actually came second um and we still put it to air with grant in the early days for those of you probably a long time ago but she developed from that and the graveyard shift and that's where she started and honed her skill you know and balancing her Twitter following and on air was problematic. <laughs> but she understood the business. She's committed to it. She's a very, very good talent to have there. And you, this, this is where management comes in. You need to be fluid. So the way you manage a Nele is different to the way you manage the next guy coming on air because of the profile of the listenership, the rate for advertising in that show, the amount of response that people get. So everything is connected. So I don't have a problem with treating people differently in a business, provided you're open and honest with everybody about what you're doing. It gains the trust of the people in the organizations. They trust you, you trust them, and you're able to manage the talent differently. You can't do that throughout the whole business. You need people who do admin, and they love it, and they do the same thing every day, and we love having them there. So it's the combination. It's, it, so in terms of other people who aren't necessarily creatives, there also is a very fine balance that needs to be struck between really making sure that you're a well-rounded individual, as um, Prof. Rachel indicated, but also making sure that you are sufficiently knowledgeable and competent in what you're doing and not just applying to everything that strikes your fancy and then you need to, you expose yourself to a lot of internal conflicts and and crises in the workplace because you don't really know what you're doing per se. So once again, going to being competent and having capacity and being able to do what you do confidently in whichever spaces you're going to 
whether that's in the creative industry or in something more corporate. Um, so there's a very valuable insight that I'm sure anybody will derive a lot of benefit from. Um, Prof. Rachel, I want to ask you then, what do you think, on a, on a different note, <laughs> of what do you think are, well, how did you get to where you are now, to having these three different streams? It's, it's, it's very interesting that you have three very seemingly <laughs> incompatible streams that which you're very good at. I was a member, I was one of your students in my first year of a number of years ago. And I know you're a good lecturer. You must be a good chair of the board. So I wonder how did you get to having these three different portfolios or three different aspects of your work life? I think perhaps I should start with saying that initially I wanted to be a chartered accountant. So I started out with a BCom accounting and then realized with all due respect to accounting that I loved economics and business management more, but I continued to do um, all three. And thank goodness I did because in business I need accounting a lot <laughs> and auditing too. Um, but I think in a way it has to do with my personality. When I was interviewed here at Stellenbosch for the, to become an associate professor, one of the people on the panel looked at my CV and said, you are doing such a range of things. Why don't you pick one and just get really deep into it? And um, it is simply not my personality. I'm too curious to, to just do one thing, but as you say, they seemingly um, contradicting, but they're really economics. And so these all complement each other, but I didn't get into it all at once. Of course, it was a systematic story. So most people come to university, do their degree and go away somewhere else. Um, I stayed and just kept putting more <laughs> interesting things on top of that. And the university gracefully allows that. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful points. And then that's, that must be quite a stark contrast to Terry, what um, has, from my point of view, please correct me if I'm wrong, of your career where it was sort of um, boss lady, corporate lady, um, CEO, and then changing into doing your own thing. So are there any differences that you've highlighted in between being an, an employee, sort of even a high level employee versus running your own consultancy and what have been your most beneficial parts of running your own consultancy? What the worst part is about running my own consultancy is uh, like admin. I mean, it was really funny when you move out the corporate world and you've been the CEO, there are people with talent everywhere in the business. So if you need a PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> marketing, if you need this, you need that, it's all there. And we started our business and the first contract we got, I couldn't convert a PDF document. So that's the worst part. <laughs> the, the other difficult part when you come out of a corporate world and you go on your own is to actually have that motivation to get up every day and be in your own office and drive yourself, it's it's quite different. So, I mean, I'm actually retired and at retirement age. So this was something new for me. And I think what I do enjoy about it is it's on my own terms. It's on, now on my own time. Um, sometimes I take a contract and within four months you think, why am I doing this? Because you're working day and night and whatever. And then I take a break for two, three months. So. I think it's just that I'm able to impart my knowledge. I love what I do. And I'm able to now take the work when I want it and do it, not necessarily in my own time once we're in the contract, but just I'm in a different phase in my life. I'm a frustrated architect. Um, I'm building houses, selling houses. Um, I'm in that creative space, so it's interesting that I'm now doing a much more creative side of my my personality. And um, yeah, and then carrying on. I like I like to keep in touch with the business world. And then I'm on a couple of charities, like you say, just to keep your your foot on the ground, your finger in the pie to really see what's happening socially as well. Um, 
where you're working, especially when you're trying to fix businesses. It's important. Thank you for all the wonderful insight. We do have a question from the chat and somebody has asked, what tips would you give to somebody who wants to venture into a new domain that's not necessarily what they're trained in or what they've studied in? And I think, Terry, because you're doing something so vastly different to what you did for 17, you said 17 years, I think we'll start with you and then if Prof Rachel, if you can give any insight after training as a CA or wanting to be a CA and then a shift. So, Terry? For me, it's simple. If you love it, go for it. That's the key. If it's something that makes you happy, because if it's um, the last thing it should be is for more money. Because if for more money and your heart's not in it, you're going to be one of those people who hate Mondays. So trying to find your passions in what you're doing is really key to having a very successful career and finding that thing that lights you on fire. Um, if there's any other question in the chat, there is another one. Somebody has asked um, that we've mentioned and we've spoken a little bit about it over this conversation, how important connections are and not only having them, but fostering them and nurturing those connections. But how is, for someone asking for advice, looking at the impact of COVID on how we interact with each other, how do you have any advice for how to foster those connections from the beginning, especially for young students who are just getting into the corporate world, especially? So I think connections are very important, um, but it's also a choice. So you find CEOs or people in business who are behind the scenes, which Funny enough, was my style for many years. So I like to be quiet, not known, behind the scenes. And therefore, I was quite independent, quiet worker because I was dealing with such a rowdy crowd all the time. Um, and you had connections in the media everywhere. So the connections in my space, I had to work out which were genuine connections and which were connections moving their way through the media for whatever reason. So that was quite a challenge. But to make good connections that you're going to use in your life is hard work. And I don't think it's one meeting and then going, you know, for a cup of coffee. You really need to work at connections. So the ones you gain to make, I don't think you should have too many because people go off in different directions and then you're sitting as a CEO and says, but so-and-so told me to come and you're thinking, oh, gosh, he's such an idiot. I don't want to sit there, you know. Or So you need to build yourself and your connections all the way through, like like friends at school, friends at varsity, and move your way through. And then when you do get the opportunity and somebody introduces you to somebody, I think it's very important that, you know, I watch some of the kids today and I'm horrified about just being polite and being grateful and perhaps not saying too much in the first meeting and rather just hearing somebody out instead of stamping the way that you want to do it. And I'm all for been forthright today and you've got to push but there is a time to wait and listen and then there's a way to go about that as well because I think too much too fast too quick too soon just doesn't work so I always find when there's a lot of noise around something I step back and I wait I wait for things to quieten down Okay, I'll, I'll make two points. One is that one should try and have people of all ages in your circle because you can learn something from very young people, but you could also learn from very experienced people. The second is a little bit about how I manage my time that I give. So one of the big pleasures for me, I um, love to listen to young entrepreneurs just um, starting out their businesses and then very often um, students or, or young people ask to talk about career choices and other people about ideas ideas they have for social impact initiatives so i structure conversations i make the the botanical gardens here on campus like my second office so i structure conversations one after the other to be efficient like a proper economist and then um, this is my trick and I'm now saying it publicly. If someone has shared what it is that they want to do, 
And I have listened and given advice where I thought it might be helpful. I always say, would you mind just jotting down what we've discussed? And then we can stay in contact and I can see where I can help in future. If the person does that, it means the conversation continues. If I don't hear from them again, it means that they were not serious in the first place. That's my conclusion. There might be other reasons, but is, that is my trick to distinguish whether it is worth continuing, um, giving my time, because there are other people that might find the time more valuable. So that's that's very important lesson to us, especially as young alumni and young people going into the world of work, of be intentional about your engagements with people and not to waste each other's time, to be blunt, just for the sake of networking at a very surface level. And then I have a question of when does that networking elevate to mentorship or what can someone do to but for you to see that they are ready for mentorship and that you would want to take on that role in their life, whether personally or professionally. I um, prefer that it develops naturally. So I still remember how astonished I was the first time somebody came to me and asked me to be their mentor. <laughs> it was an incredible feeling of surprise, but also really it felt like recognition. Um, but I try to not push it, but um, let it develop naturally. So if it turns out that in a particular phase in their life or their career, someone needs a mentor and they think that I could add that value, I would do it. Um, I do not believe in a very structured mentorship relationship where you say we have to meet every second Tuesday of the month or you know, um, uh, even if we don't have anything that we need to deal with at that point. So for me, um, I think it's, it's a really uh, important contribution to make if one can be a mentor, um, but it should be natural. Yeah, I was just to add to that, it's got to fit. So you'll feel it. And I had the same experience. The first time somebody asked me to be a mentor, I burst out laughing. But um, I've enjoyed it. And um, sometimes, even though they're looking to you for advice, I found because I was mentoring people in the business, but that also had other interests in different things, they taught us quite a bit about the business. So mentorship is wonderful. It does take time. So I'm a bit like you. So I have a slightly different rule. Mine goes strike one, strike two, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> so normally, you know, I always listen to the first excuse why something didn't happen, yada, yada, yada. Okay, I'm going to trust you. But if it happens again, I'm done. Because it's quite, it's, it's not only imparting knowledge, it's emotional. And there's a connection with somebody and it goes beyond just work. You know, you get to know the person, family, things come in, which I think is incredibly important to get to mentor people. But also when you're in a business, you've got to take time to know your staff. So I know some com companies are very big and you can't possibly, but I don't see why a CEO cannot walk the floor from time to time and be open, you know, so it's like leading the way. Uh, encouraging them, challenging them, you know, and celebrating successes with them and encouraging their hearts, I think is important. If you find that key, people fall over themselves. We all like to be treated well and we all like to be liked. You know, you don't have to be in love with a person, but you do have to like the person that you're working with. Even if they're difficult, then you like the role that they play for you in it. But, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question in the chat um, asking, how does one stay motivated and positive um, during this turbulent period in, term, in the country and in our world? And especially in the context of the workplace, I think a lot of the conversation that we've had today has centered around when you get there and you're excited and everything is good and you find a mentor and you're confident, but what happens in those times when you're just pushing paper 
and you are just doing all the grit work and you're really not enjoying where you're working and what would what tips do you have for keeping motivated and positive in a space when you're really uncertain about your career i'll start i think firstly you need a goal so even when you're in that rut i remember being in sales trying to make targets oh my goodness how am i going to pay the rent etc so you've got all that pressure but the moment you start being taught to throw forward so i mean we had stupid little sayings like how do you eat an elephant one small bite at a time we had don't shoot for the lamppost you know shoot for the stars then you'll hit the lamppost so we were always driving people to have a goal and in sales we would say well what car do you want to drive like and all of a sudden all these pictures of ferraris and porsches were up on people's boards or where would you like to travel so you know putting a goal out there gets you through the bad months or the harder times but that said part of your goal has to also be where you want to be in the business or where you think you're tracking and i think kids today are too, too impatient i mean they'll do something for six months and then want to be the manager of the department the problem with that is sometimes people have a natural ability and they could possibly do that but most times if you push people beyond where they're at you go through stations in life that management role can kill you and you tumble down out of the corporate ladder. Unfortunately, in South Africa, sometimes when you push it and you don't do the management well, job well, you're out there on that level of salary now and out there and people only realize you still can't do the job when you take the next one because recruitment in this country has deteriorated. And I think, you know, companies are, are battling. But there's opportunities for individuals. And if you're focused and you have goals and you're doing the right thing and you're passionate about what you're doing, you will make it. You will make it. You'll be surprised. Only 2% of the workplace actually does that. The rest just plot. You need the plotters, but yeah. Okay, can I, I'll just add to that. If you're, if you're in your environment and you feel you're doing a mundane job or a repetitive job, you have to be honest with yourself and ask whether this is temporary. In other words, I am doing this because I have to learn things so that I can get to the next step. So you have to ask, what is it for? And that's a decision only you can make um, that if it is something that's advancing your career or whether you are not, if you're not internally, you don't have any drive that you want to be somewhere else. So you have to spend time thinking it through whether there is somewhere else that you want to be. And then the next question is, what do I have to do to get to where I want to be? And if that means you have to take a few courses here, um, do something extra to enable you to go beyond what you feel now as uh, is a situation that demotivates you, then you have to really do it because otherwise your motivation, it's not going to come back automatically. So I'm gathering that it's very important to be goal focused and to have targets and to be honest with yourself as well in terms of how you engage with the workplace and also how you reflect on what you're doing and how much it means to you. And that will really carry you through some of these tough moments. So I think that'll help a lot of the people in the workspace right now through managing that um, learning curve, which we've heard can be quite steep. And there is another question in the chat, um, which I saw, just give me a moment. There was another one. This one was asking about personal branding. The question is asking about the word personal branding is thrown around quite often when it comes to trying to identify yourself or your characteristics. And in your personal opinion, and having worked with different people in the media industry, what does personal branding really mean? I'll throw this one to you, Prof. Rachel. I have only once in my life used the term personal branding with respect to myself. And that was in response to um, an organization that was putting up an event for Women's Day and was considering the people that they are inviting to participate in relation to their personal branding. So I said, I have 
no mission to have personal branding. I am who I am. I have my values. I love those values. And if other people see that as a brand, that's fine. But I am not deliberately building a personal brand. However, if it is something that appeals to you and you feel that this is having a personal brand will advance your dreams and, and your goals, then please go for it. But I'll put one caveat, and that is if you build that personal brand online, it's there forever. <laughs> so you have to be very careful what you include in your posts, especially videos online, because you might feel today my personal brand is something quite flexible, anything goes. And then 10 years from now, you might run, want to be president and come back to bite you. So you have to, if you decide to build a personal brand, you have to be very careful how you do it. So just to, the key is to be authentic, really. So Terry, I see that you're nodding and you're quite agreeing with what Prof Rachel is saying. Do you have anything that you'd like to add to that? No, I agree with everything. I think that um, I was the same. I am who I am. What you see is what you get. Um, people build your brand around your success as well. So you are known as a certain individual regardless. Um, I was known as the Iron Lady or the bitch from hell or <laughs> like a couple of things which were not true, but it was the, you know, when people are outside looking in and you're driving hard and people are like, shit, 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 yeah, she comes or whatever. So things trickle out. But I've seen people build personal brands. Stuff lands up there at a staff party. Um, alcohol is involved. The video pops up. And it just never goes away. You have to be so, so careful. And it's popped up like that with people coming. You know, you've got to be careful who you're putting on air, public personas, and you go and do that search. I mean, you wipe out 70% of the applicants on silly stuff that's not going to be accepted and somebody's going to pull it up, you know. So... It's a it's a real problem. You cannot get rid of your digital footprint. So it's very, very important. And you do change. So when you're in your 20s and you're passionate about frogs, you might not be in your 30s, you know, and then you're on something else and these things. So you've got to be careful. I don't think I don't think it's that necessary to build a brand. I think if you're successful and you do well, your brand gets built for you and that's what you've got to control. So there's a little bit work of work there that needs to be done where you see what people are saying or if something is published that you correct it and you make sure it's right. But the quieter I think you are, the better because people are interested. And then though they find you, people, they'll all find you. They found you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for those insights. So I'm hearing a lot about sort of some of the negative parts of technology and its impact on the individual on in terms of their search for the world of work, work or where they fit in in the world of work. How do you think, just on a more broad question, just in general, how do you think technology has or will impact the world of work in the next, let's say, five to ten years? How much time have we got? <laughs> According to the clock, we still have about 20 to 30 minutes, so you can go as long as you need. <laughs> I think the impact is um, going to be varied in the sense that there will be amazing opportunities. I tend to get very excited about the opportunities. But if we do nothing, if we do not prepare for it, there will also be job losses. And um, we have to already start thinking, we should have started to think about it already a while back. Um, but I was in conversation with my students today. I said, think about what are the things that humans do that are incredibly valuable that artificial intelligence and algorithm cannot do. And one of it is um, 
turning a whole lot of information into knowledge that makes sense and that we can communicate very well. So an algorithm can take all of the knowledge on the internet and try and produce an essay. Sometimes you hit it and it, it's a very good essay. Other times it's a whole lot of gibberish. Um, it'll get better, but what it cannot do, and it's going to be a while before it can do that, is produce insights. So our brains can Sometimes if you give it enough time, it can come up with really amazing insights. And in the world of work where time is precious, insights are very valuable. And so is making sense of things because we are overrun with data, but data literally are point, lots of millions of points of data. Um, somebody has to make sense of it. And it's it's a value that that human beings can bring. So in my view, it's not an either or. There are many mundane jobs, for example, in accounting and auditing, that can be done by machines. So what will happen in that profession is that they will learn new skills. For example, they'd be working in teams with data scientists and um, other people, um, even maybe philosophers, to um, to add new value in addition to what they what we learned when we did accounting. So all of the things, the tasks that are very repetitive and can easily be automated. Those can be done by machines, but I think it's it will be complementary roles. Just think about it for us at the university doing research and people in business will have to gather information. When we used to do research, we had to send out questionnaires by post. That's how I still had to do it when I started in, in the academic world. And then you have to hope that people will fill in your questionnaires and send it back. And if you were going to do surveys, you have to personally go, you have to train a few people to help you, and you personally have to go in the field and get the, the responses to your survey. Then you have to code them. It's a whole long process, and eventually you do some analysis. Now we're in the position where we get lots of data. Sometimes we get real-time data, and we have the tools. So we can save a lot of time and money because we don't have to go out and get the data. So we we prepare the data. We have to make sure that the, that it genuine is um, from the source that that it's supposed to come and that it was ethically sourced and all of the requirements. But then we can do amazing things with the data. And in the end, it's the human with the domain knowledge, the person who knows about economics or business management or media who can make sense of the results that we get once we've given the machine the task to inter to process the data. So we're the ones who will be telling the story based on that analysis eventually. So I'm going to stop there because this is this is a topic that I'm really very much into, so you don't want me to talk for 10 minutes on it. Please, Terry. Obviously, data in any business is very important, and you're so right. You can get so much research that it is so confusing. So it's important what you take out of the research. And it's important <clears throat> to know why you did the research in the first place. So sometimes you get stuff in, but you're, you've got to ask the question, why was this done? For what purpose? Because it can lead you down the wrong path. I love getting the data that's been sorted and having the conversation on what are we going to do with it or what does it mean but i must be honest many a business now that i'm going into to help fix is because the whole business is run with respect by a bunch of accountants so i'm not being funny there you know what i mean if it's just on those numbers which is the most powerful number in any company they're either making money or they're not making money. So you can imagine, it's like your budget every time, every month at home. It's, it is key, it, it, it is gonna come up. 
But if you then make decisions on your business only based on your bottom line, whether it's up or down, you're going to make mistakes. You need much better quality insights as to what to do with it rather than to make a decision only based on, I'm specifically saying numbers rather than data, because you can get very different research that you quantify, you know, do you like this person? Do you want to hear more of them? Do you want to hear less of them? You know, that, that sort of quantitative data. So you've got to be very careful of qualitative data unless it's in the domain where it's being used. So for instance, we could test a topic on air by looking immediately at the data live, real time, coming through the SMS line, the WhatsApp line, the phone line, on the website, on the Twitter feed. So there is a place where that data instantly will tell you to cut a subject, move off, go on to something else because you're not getting a response. But I think it plays a very big role. But I also think it's it could be the undoing of many people because they just get fixated with reams and reams of data. A lot of food for thought on the role of technology. And I think it needs a whole week-long event hosted by the alumni office in its own respect. <laughs> Um, there is another question on the similar notes, on a similar vein regarding technology. And somebody has asked that they've observed that LinkedIn is a popular platform hailed for professionalism and significant for exposing yourself and your skills. Is it really important to have a LinkedIn profile and do you deem it important when filtering through potential employees? Um, Prof. Rachel, I'll ask you in the HR space especially. Indeed, it is one of the the places where um, prospective employers will look. Um, it is not the only one, um, but it is. It's very often a start, even for um, for young entrepreneurs. If they go out fundraising, then um, they would they would be asked to provide their LinkedIn profile. And if they have recommendations on their profile, it does make quite a difference. So yes, I think it is important. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for that. Um, just one more question. Unfortunately, there isn't enough time to go into all of the questions on the chat. And thank you to all of the people who are engaging with the Teams chat. And we do wish that we had enough time, but please be sure to check in with the other World of Work events that are happening throughout the week. And just keep in touch, and I'm sure that they will get back to you with an answer soon enough. But the final question is then just, what's your take on having your hand in different pies in the sense that you may do different jobs in your lifetime, as opposed to staying in a job for five to 10 years? And fortunately, we have experience of both of those areas because you are comfortable or because you want to specialize? This person is hoping that they make sense. But just generally, as, as both of you have had careers in both of those aspects, just what do you think is your take on, would you do it again? Do you have any regrets? And what do you make of your own careers? OK, I loved every minute of my career. So if I think back, in the early days in sales, obviously there was pressure, but the environment was such fun. It was so creative. The people were divine. I was also fortunate to be there at a time where it was growing and developing. South Africa was coming out of all its old crap. The SABC was selling off all the radio stations and things were going private and there was black economic empowerment and it was hell of exciting. And my career took off with that. I was on the same trajectory. So I went through pre, post, um, transforming the business, um, which was probably my most successful role in the part we enjoyed the most. So I wouldn't change a thing. Um, I had a, a wonderful time. I've forgotten the last part of that question. I asked away too many questions. But... Yeah, but there was another point I wanted to make, but carry on. I'll... Okay, so... Um... I just I want to say that it used to be that if someone looked at your CV and you moved every two years, they would say, "What is wrong with this person? Are they being in, um, unstable?" 
but these days it's not frowned upon. So you have the opportunity to try something. I was talking to someone the other day who comes from biotechnology and is now working in insurance. And he's doing it to gain um, experience. And he would probably stay three years and go somewhere else. Um, I do want to say that if you if you choose to have a collection of different things, the the one of the requirements is that you have to manage your diary with an iron fist <laughs> because otherwise you might some things might fall by the wayside. So you then have to be very particular about how you manage your time. What I was going to say there is, although I was in the same company, I did different roles. So that's also important because you, you're dealing with management or you're dealing with sales or you're dealing with marketing or you're dealing with digital. So the type of company had those opportunities. But now in hindsight that I'm doing such very different things with my time, I think it's important that we do different things. And like you say, if somebody's job hopping every two years in the same type of job, that's problematic. But if somebody on a CV has done something for five years and now they've decided, no, well, I don't want to do that anymore, like on air talent wanting to go in sales, I think it's a good thing, you know. Thank you so much, everybody, for spending this time with us this evening. And thank you very, very much to our two speakers tonight. I think we've given a lot of people a lot of things to think about once they get home and a lot of food for thoughts on their careers and all the different strategies to win and have as exciting careers as the two of you have had. So thank you very much for the time and for letting me be a facilitator. And I think then we're wrapping it up and I hope you all have a safe, warm evening. And that's all for today. Thank you. <laughs>